So, you've got data, a training data set, and it's got mistakes in it. This always happens. Most machine learning talks about the latest, greatest classifier and how it's going to improve your accuracy. And they're great, and you have to do that, but it's usually about 2% increase in accuracy, whereas cleaning up your data is easy 5% in my experience, and it's a lot easier to do. So, <clears throat> what we're going to talk about today is just some of the process of how you go around cleaning up your data. So, it's a Python notebook. Uh, it's up here on the GitHub, if anyone wants to play along later. You can send me questions or anything you want. So, the risk of always running things live. Let's see if this works. The idea of this talk is just to give you a checklist. Have a check for this, have a check for this, have a check for this. It's a process of cleaning up your data. The process changes all the time. You might have a better one or a different one or things that I can add to this one. But at least if you have a process, you can go A to Z and go, right, the data should be a bit better now. I've checked all these things. So, first thing is load the data. What is the data here? So, you're making a chatbot for a company, a, a farm that sells rabbits. And on Facebook or on WeChat or one of these instant messaging uh, apps, people are sending you questions. Yep. So, questions like, are the baby rabbits certified? And you have to recognize that that is rabbit certification. Usually in a chatbot, you have about 10 to 20 topics, things that the chatbot is about. So, the domain. In airlines, it's tickets and seats and bags. In banks, it's like accounts and those sorts of things. So usually like a, a noun. And then a verb acts on that noun. So it's cancel a ticket, cancel a card, book a ticket. Usually that's what your uh, classifications look like. So actually, I haven't mentioned my background here. So I work for Openjaw, currently working, which is an airline travel company. Currently working in Chinese and a bit of Norwegian. I used to work for IBM Watson, where I made chatbots for Mercedes, Credit Mutual, Orange Bank France, lots of different companies like that. So, you load your data. Chatbot data tends to be short utterances, I call them questions, short questions that people ask, and an intent. So, this is just a bit of data for anyone who hasn't built a chatbot before. You're talking you probably end up with about 500 questions when you get to start making a classifier, and at the end you hope to have about 2,000. If you're working in China, the first day they hand over 10,000 questions. They just have vast amounts of data, but it's a bit different. Okay, so what's the actual analysis like? Everyone here probably deals with k-folds, but I've just written out the code here to do a k-fold, just so people understand it's not magic. What you're doing is you're chopping up your data into groups. You're training on four-fifths of it, testing on one-fifth of it and just seeing how you're doing. The reason I'm doing it this way is because if you're looking for bad data, it's probably something you predict wrongly. If you're able to predict it with your classifier later on, it was probably good data. If you get it wrong with your classifier, it's a much higher chance it's bad data. So what we're trying to show here is to look for bad data, uh, the first place to start looking for is in the things you categorize incorrectly. That's most likely where your bad data is. If anyone here deal with images, a few people deal with images, this talk isn't about images, but it's the same idea. If you have a cat or a dog detector, if something is correctly, if, if something is correctly detected as a cat, it's probably right. Yeah? It's, your data has to be really bad before you start making mistakes on things that, you know, that you're worried about. So this is just a hand... Uh, and uh, <coughs> k-fold generator. Again, most machine learning talks are about this part, the NLP pipeline, how you chop up your text, what sort of crazy classifier you do. I'm just doing something very simple here because that's not what this talk is about. Uh, for people who don't deal with language, what a count vectorizer does is it turns all the words into something the machine can read. So is aardvark present? Is zebra present? It in turns the language into something, into a vector that a computer can read. And this classifier here is just a SVM classifier. It's quite a simple thing. And we're going to run a k-fold test. So there's my accuracy, 73%, which is actually pretty good for the first time you want a classifier. It tends to be about 65%, and then cleaning up your data brings you up the extra 4 or 5%. So what can we do with that? Well, I've written all the checks to these, check these, Spreadsheet. So if we open that spreadsheet, which hopefully I have here, let's check these. What 
What we're going to look at, at here is the ones we got wrong. Yeah, because the ones we got wrong is probably where the bad training data is. Does that make sense? Okay, so anyway, filter by zero, and you can find the ones got, that, that you got wrong. And that means instead of checking 100% of your data, you're now checking 25% of your data. It's a bit better. You're a bit, bit easier to check through things. All right. Handy thing here, this doesn't do anything, but if you write your accuracy off to a file, the number of questions you have, the number of intents you have, how accurate you are, it means you can show the boss later, look, things are getting better. Yeah, This is what I did this week. Things got 1% better. You can show them a graph. It's always handy to do some sort of record of how well you're doing. OK, now there's particular kinds of errors that uh, we're going to look, look for. I've always noticed in tutorials, they never tell you what your data should look, at, look like right now. So you end up sort of going two or three steps too far and things don't work and you're going, wait, am I actually lost? So I like putting in, this is what your data currently looks like. So we have this question. This is what the ground truth, what our training data says, uh, says the intention is. And it could be wrong. And where it's wrong, we want to fix that. You have what we predicted it as. So we say it's rabbit health. Our classifier predicted it as purchase a rabbit. It was really high confidence, which is bad. If you're going to be wrong, you're better off being wrong with low confidence. Makes sense. And we even got the second one wrong. You know, you want to be kind of, if you don't get the first one right and you, and you have high confidence, at least the second one. So that's not a good uh, classification. So zero confidence. Yeah, so SGD is kind of a weird classifier. It's not as bad as Naive Bayes. Naive Bayes is terrible for saying I'm 99% confident when it really shouldn't be. Uh, you want a good classifier to be like, about as confident as it should be. So when it's 70% confident, it's 70% of the time it's right. And uh, this doesn't actually have that feature. So first one is obvious, which it actually probably won before, is duplicates. Is there any duplicated data in the code? And there, it, it isn't. So you do tend to get duplicates in training data. I don't quite know why. They just always sneak in. Your process should probably be a bit better to make sure they don't, but they do. You can get near duplicates, which is where someone has put in an extra comma or an extra space or you know, some tiny difference. Uh, and you can try and make up new rules to find that, you know, strip out all the spaces, strip out, strip out all the question marks. But it's the next step kind of spots them anyway, so it's not worth doing. So the next step is where something is classified wrongly. You say it's a rabbit when actually it's a dog, but you can kind of see why the, why the system made the mistake. And that is, so here, I have high confidence, confidence over 95%, and I'm wrong. So that's kind of the first thing you look for. If you're really high confidence and you're wrong, there's a good chance your training data is wrong, yeah? That you've said it should be rabbit health when actually it's purchased rabbit. You've just made a mistake. This stuff happens. So that's the first thing I check for is where are we, where are we classified incorrectly according to our grain truth but we are really high confidence and look through those to see if you were wrong, if your classification you put in the grain truth was incorrect. So the next one, and this one's kind of philosophically hard to deal with, is frequently you get two questions uh, asked. So someone will ask something like, I've lost my card, can I cancel it and get a new one? To a bank, that's two, two different questions. To a person, you just think, oh, that's one job. Go do that for me. A bank thinks that it's two different things because two different departments deal with it and all this. So here is the confidence of my second prediction. So my first prediction was uh, rabbit health. My second best guess was this. If that's quite high, that's a sign that maybe two questions were asked. Does that make sense? Yeah. So, here, for example, this one here happens to be two different questions stuck together. Now, there's issues with how you deal with this because, <clears throat> first of all, with the bank card example, you could say to people, sorry, tough, you have to ask separately, how do I cancel the card? And come back to me and say, how do I book a new one? But that's really bad user experience. If someone's mental model of a bank is that's one question, the customer's kind of right, particularly if it's very common. So you have to say, right, sorry, bank, you're incorrect. 
when, pe when you think people are asking two questions, they're actually just asking one thing, and you've got to make them one intention. Uh, the other, so I actually have a list here. So customers see one task, and the business sees two. The business is wrong. You've got to make your chatbot match the mental model of the customer, because that's just how they think. Another time you see this is complaints. Complaints are a weird one, because people tend to complain about two or three things at once. So the food was terrible and there wasn't enough of it. These sorts of things happen, you know, and you lost my bag and the plane was late. What you can do is you can make one big complaint intention. So everyone giving out goes to one place. But the problem with doing that is people complain about everything. The flight's delayed, the seats don't work, the airport's terrible, and that complaint intent ends up catching everything. Yeah, because all the possible words people ever use is somewhere in the complaint intent. So you have to kind of break up the complaint intent into complaining about meals, complaining about seats, complaining about whatever is your domain. But then you get the problem of someone comes in with a complaint and it's three or four of those different sub complaints. So what I tend to do is if you detect any kind of a complaint, hand it over to a person. So they've complained about the meal and their bag at the same time. You've detected as 50% complain about meal, 50% complain about bag. Just treat that as a generic complaint and say, I'm sorry this is bad, we'll get a person to talk to you. Uh, again, I always hand over complaints to people if at all possible because no one wants to hear the robot really cares that you're not happy. It just isn't a good experience, you know? Uh, speaking of handing over to people, there is some debate about whether a chatbot should admit it's a person. We miss it's a, miss it's a person, I miss it that it's a robot. Yeah, and this is one of the main reasons why you should. If you're talking to a person, it's entirely reasonable to say, I want to cancel my bank card, I want to check my balance, and I want to see when you're open. Humans can deal with that. Chatbots can't. So if you find in your data you're getting loads of these double questions and triple questions, it means your introduction, hi, I'm a chatbot, please ask me simple questions one at a time, phrase better than that isn't quite good enough. So that's something to look for, that you'll see this in the chatbots I've built, you'll see double questions, one or two of them, just because the customer's understanding of the domain is different from people's, as they are different from the, the bank, so cancel a card, book a new one, that problem. But if you see it an awful lot, it's because your explanation of, I'm a chatbot, please ask me simple questions, isn't quite clear enough to people. And then the last reason is sometimes people just make a mistake. Some people just ask two questions and you've tried to have a clear understanding. What you probably will do is in the logic of your chatbot is if your second confidence is above 40%, come back with, uh, what you can do is you can come back with either, I'm not sure, please ask me again, simply. Or you can have like a canonical question, which is like the question for every intent you wish they asked. So, you know, the ideal question. And you can come back with the two ideal questions for the two intents you come back with. So one is, I think you might be asking, how do I report a bag stolen? And one is, I think you might be uh, complaining about the food. And the person can decide, they, they then see, oh wait, there's two questions I'm actually asking here. Uh, so this is a difficult one philosophically, because should you separate out the two questions? Should you go, great, there's a complaint about the food. Great, there's a question about the seat. There's reasons why you shouldn't and that person did really ask this question. This is the real data, but in practice you tend to actually spit them out. Okay, so the next one here is just silly, uh, bad data, which again you think shouldn't really get into your training set, but it kind of does. Not very many of them, so here we're looking for where the first confidence is really low. So just if, you've, if, the, if the classifier has no idea what's happening, it's just like there's a good chance that some nonsense has slipped in there. So uh, frequently in text data sets, you see this when your uh, UTF-8 or something has made a mistake and it's mangled the text. Yeah, for some reason, it's only happened on one or two questions. Go back and find what those questions were, obviously. But it's just a sign you don't want just nonsense characters in your training data. So it's something you look for. And again, this could happen with images. If you run a classifier and you know, it just destroys the image, and then you go you know, do a KFOL test, look back at the data, and something's really low confidence, there's a good chance if you look at that image, it's just sort of garbled. 
that way over time. Seems really quick. Okay, so those three are really simple things to check. I can do it in Chinese in, in, the, in the sense that I can explain what those three different signals mean. High confidence, second value. Very low confidence, first value. Very high confidence, but wrong. I can explain that to one of my Chinese teammates, and they can actually look at the data for those particular issues. Yeah? They're quite simple things to understand. And even someone who isn't you know, running the Python notebooks can say, if you give them that data, here's what to look for in it. That makes sense then. They go, right, I can, f I can see what you're talking about. Let's go look for that kind of a problem. You get into more complicated issues then next, which is, so this is a very sloppy bit of code, but basically what I'm saying here is, get me how accurate each particular intention is. So, if you've only got examples, something that isn't that common, you're not going to be that accurate with it. Uh, in Watson, it was about 20 is what we wanted. It's gone down a good bit. The sort of uh, word embeddings have really improved things on low volume intents. But they're also not that important. If you've only ever seen a question five times, even if you get it wrong, it's not going to happen very often. Do you know what I mean? So what you need to worry about in particular is those questions that you do see a lot that you're bad at. Yeah? So it's a rare question. You're not very high accuracy on it. It's not good, you want to fix it. But what you really want to fix is the questions you see a lot that you're not very accurate in, yeah? So here's our accuracy, here's how many times we've seen it. If you've got sort of more than 20 examples and your accuracy is below, say, 75%, you want to then go look at that particular intention because there's something a bit weird about it, yeah? So, everyone here uses confusion matrices. You've seen them before, I don't need to explain them. So the idea is, this is, what, this is what we said it was, and this is what we predicted. And if you find a, actually, I'll run it, show while I'm at it. OK, so this is quite a low number of intents, obviously enough. Is there anything jumping out of us here that, like, it's not on this middle track? This one here is jumping out. What we said was rabbit socialization is frequently detected as rabbit health. Yeah? So you can kind of imagine why people are asking about is the rabbit happy and healthy and being reared well? Or they're asking about, is, it, is the rabbit healthy? So you can see why you'd mix those two up. So that's telling you, right, that there is where we should look. So again, all we're trying to do here is narrow down where to look for bad example training questions. It gets quite difficult here because, and this is something you can't really do in Chinese, or I can't really do in Chinese or whatever. It has to be somebody who really understands the domain and the language because I can say, look here. You can do things like uh, look here for this particular problem. So we can see rabbit health and rabbit socialization seem to be too similar to each other. But you need to look at the, the questions. First of all, look to see if one of the training questions is just misplaced. It should be this and it is that, and that's dragging everything together. But other than that, it can be things like rabbit health and rabbit socialization might both use the word happy a lot. These sorts of things happen. There's a lot of just crossover. So what do you do then? There's a few frequent things you do. First one is you split out another sort of parent intent that deals with happy rabbits. And then you separate out the other socialization and health to everything other than happy. That kind of separates out the two intents. Uh, it's a black art, this part. When you've done the sort of tick box of things and you've found why right, these two intents are being mixed up, why? You load them both up in your Excel, you read them both, you try to understand them. Can you combine them? Uh, frequently, in fact, always the client wants to have more intents than they want. You want to end up with about 50 intents, they want to end up with about 200. It's just the way it is, and you end up having to fight them to say no. <coughs> don't split this intent up, don't split this intent up. You're better off to be accurate and a bit vague. You know, I think you're worrying about rabbit health. Here's my general answer, click here for more details and getting that right, rather than you're worried about rabbit ear health and worried about rabbit feet health and only getting that right half the time. Do you know what I mean? You're better off being sort of a bit too general, but giving people more information and being accurate than just being really, really specific, but just getting the wrong intention. So. The 
Confusion matrix gives you clues of where to look to find bad data, particularly after all the steps you've gone through. But it, you can't really give you a checklist of exactly look for this and look for that. All it's doing is, you know, here's the two intents that are getting mixed up. Look at them both together. See if there's questions that are, you know, obviously in the wrong place. See if maybe you can merge them as an intent. The client usually won't let you, but sometimes it, it's, it's a step you kind of sometimes have to take. Uh, but confusion matrix is sort of a bit of a dark art. There's another issue, just to make things even more complicated, is if you're using training and test sets, like you should be, you're cleaning up your training set, your test set could still have the same mistakes in it. So what do you do there? You know, you can't clean up your test set with these problems because you're reading it then, or your validation set to the same extent. So you know, I'll get someone else to do it. But the level of knowledge you need to have with this sort of checking through the text, you need to understand the domain, you need to read it a lot. It's not like, is this a rabbit or a cat? You know, that anyone can do. This, to be able to go through the test set and find these sort of problems, you have to be working on the project, at which point it kind of stops being a test set. And I don't know the correct answer for that, but just be aware that that's an issue, that if you have bad data and it's bad in the test set, that's really going to hinder you for obvious reasons. But cleaning up your data is going to stop it being a test set then at some point, because you're going to understand it well enough that you'll just sort of make, make rules. OK, so now, another bunny here. This is something that is very obvious to people who do NLP, but mightn't be if you're first project. I was saying earlier that you've got 500 example questions you build up your first uh, classifier with. Yeah? But what happens when you do user testing or next week another 500 questions come along? You're tempted to go back to the original process, which was look at a question, decide the topic, do that for all 500, then go through each individual topic and go, right, I know these are dealing with tickets. Is this a cancel a ticket or book a ticket? Is it which of the verbs is operating on this, uh, on this topic? But you've built a classifier. It's pretty good. It's 75%. Let's just use it to save us a lot of work. Yeah? So I think probably most people in this room know this trick here, where you just load up that classifier again, use it to classify all your data, and that way, you're going through 500 questions, say, and you're saying, do I agree with the classifier? It's a much simpler question than going through 500 questions and going, what topic is this? And what intent is this? That's, that takes you a long time. Whereas, was the classifier correct or not? It's quite fast, particularly in batch mode, because you're going through all the rabbit health questions and going, is it rabbit health? Is it rabbit health? Is it rabbit health? And in that batch mode, you can do things really, really fast. So when you've built a classifier, you use it to label your data. I think most people here know this, but just in case you don't. And let's have a look at how those labels go down. So yeah, they're all 100% because it's fake data. And real data would be a bit lower than that. But you then have lots of data classified that you can go through very quickly and just say, do I agree or do I not agree? And that means you've gone up from 500 uh, training questions to 1,000 much, much faster. And that is going to improve your accuracy overall. Like the graph earlier, almost always, the more questions you have, the higher accuracy you have. And if not, there's something deeply wrong. So label the code and then go through it in batch mode. And then if we have time, uh, obviously, you want to be able to show your boss some pictures. So here's what my accuracy looks like. Yeah, I've only got one training session in here. So a one, one bar, bar graph is no use. But then next week, you can say, look, I was 75%. We've added new questions from the label data. We're now up to 77%. You can show progress. So it's always handy in these notebooks to output some sort of graph about how things have improved. Uh, and yeah, the final bit here was just about how to tokenize data and how to chop up. It depends on the language. I've deliberately kept the classifier in this very simple, which means your accuracy is a bit lower, but it's just very simple. It's only a one-line classifier. OK, so the tasks involved in, and this is particularly for chatbots because they're kind of easier to understand, but in general, obvious stuff. Load your data. 
language specific stuff like obviously in Chinese there's no spaces so you're going to need a word segmenter uh, dealing with particularly French you have serious problems with accents because most of the time they don't put in accents so you have to make a decision of do you assume they're making a spelling mistake if they don't put in the accent or not and it gets messy uh, we've run the KFO test and the point of that was to show us where the classifier goes wrong because that's most likely where our training data is wrong that make sense uh, now, based on those wrong data, we look for particular things. Duplicates, obviously enough. High confidence and wrong, because it's quite likely the classifier is correct, but our training data is wrong for those ones. Double questions, you get into philosophical problems then about, oh wait, what do we do about the double questions? But at least know you have a problem, yeah? Uh, Nonsense, so there's really low confidence questions. Have a look through them in case there's just been a parsing error or something weird. Uh, you can spend ages when you get the first 500 questions or the first set of data trying to get everything perfect, but you're wasting your time. You won't get perfect until you've gone through the 500 questions. You will make mistakes. You're kind of better off being fast, learning from the mistakes, and then going back on the 500 and fixing them then. Because if you wait till you know everything before you label things, you'll never label anything and you'll only learn that from labeling things, if that makes sense. Uh, look at the confusion matrix. It tells you two particular intents to look at and why something's happening. In the case of uh, complaints, you'll see everything's being stuck in complaints, and that means you've made one generic complaint issue, and that's, that's a common mistake. And now you've built this classifier. Now you've improved the training data. You've got something really handy here to help you label new data to really speed you up. So, okay, that was just a quick review of the problems I look for in a data set. And this sort of thing, you know, in a morning, you can really, you know, get rid of mistakes in your training data and boost your accuracy. This is most of what machine learning talks are about, if you know what I mean. Uh, and I'm going to say some stuff and people will disagree, and that's fine. So, the starting how to do, how to make text readable for, for uh, computers says do TFIDF, term frequency inverse docu document frequency. That works well with long documents like newspaper stories or you know a doctor's report, that sort of thing. It's a big long thing and if they're saying melanoma, that's not a normal word, that's important there. But with chatbots, all your questions are about 7 to 12 words long. They, people don't tend to put in paragraphs so TFIDF doesn't actually help in my experience. Again, you try it but it doesn't tend to help. Uh, in terms of n-grams, uh, the sort of the sliding window of how many words you're looking at to go, they do help. You're probably looking at two words because credit card tells you a lot more than the word credit and the word card happening to be in the same sentence. So n-grams tend to help. Uh, what other stop words? Yes, stop words in this case helps hugely. Again, depends on the language. In Chinese, stop words don't help at all. Uh, Entities can help as well, but so entities are like look for a city, look for a thing, like a proper noun usually, or like a, 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 a ticket number, some sort of unique number that that's, they can really help improve your accuracy. But the issue is programmers in particular go entity crazy. They try and turn everything into an entity. So every single question that comes in, they go, does it contain the word bank? Then it must mean this exact intention. It, we just, as it, it's, programmers are really bad at making chatbots for that particular reason. They just go entity crazy and they turn everything into like an expert system, if then else. And it's just hideous. It doesn't work. It's really brittle. So yes, use entities, but I don't go near entities until I get an accuracy up to about 80%. And then I use entities because if you start chasing entities too early, or same with chit chat. Chit chat is like hello and thank you and jokes and stuff. Get your, get your ground truth really good and then worry about those extras because they'll soak up all of your time and not improve your ground truth, if you know what I mean.